So there's a lot of ways to make a handle, at least four ways in all actuality. Um, some are more complicated than others. Uh, I'm going to show you at least three visually, and I will hint at how the fourth one gets done. And I will be putting on a handle so you can see how the process does work. So the first way that you can do it, this requires a little hand building knowledge. I know this is a wheel throwing class, but ultimately it all kind of like gels together on what you should learn and how to do it. So the first way that you can make a handle, which is very simple, is you pound out a slab. Okay? You can throw it down elongate it. We have rolling pins around. Do a rolling pin thing. It's very much like making a cookie sheet. Right? Uh, there is a slab roller uh, that you could quickly learn to use by asking any technician. Um, I'll happily show you how to use a slab roller too. I don't know, like if I'm crossing boundaries because there's like a hand building class. This is the wheel throwing class. But anyway, slabs are a way that you can make a handle. And there's a couple ways you can do it. Okay. You can do a very simple C. And some people like the look of this. All right. Some people, I've seen this, I think it's actually a really cool design choice. They'll just do a flat semicircle. Okay? And they'll have their mug or their cup. And this works really well in like a small teacup. And they can attach like so or like so, okay? It works really well with a hand-built one or like a small thrown one. People tend to like this, especially at a smaller size. Something about like this size. Well, let's imagine the cup being about half the size, right? It kind of works. Every two fingers, you can pick up and drink three for an espresso cup. If you want to do like a small little espresso cup, that would definitely work. Now, the other way that you can make a handle, which I'll just look to make that, is over there. That's what's called an extruder. And what I'm pointing to is this thing right next to the door. Extruders push out clay. If everyone, did everyone play with Play-Doh as a kid? I wouldn't be shocked because we're all here now, so. <laughs> but I did, right? If you remember, like, you could push it through something and you get, like, a star shape or you could get, like, you know, a circle shape or a square shape. Well, that's basically what that is, but for adults and for massive clay use. You have your certain different dies. You take, like, a big chunk of clay, you throw it in there, you lift it, you push it down, and you can get long, perfect, thin ribbons, shorter ribbons. You can get hexagonal, you can get circle, you can get square. You can get a lot of things, and so you can use that to extrude a handle and then connect it. That's a really cool way. I've done that for pieces, especially ones that I wanted a really nice thin um, like ribbon to use. Currently working on a piece like that in the studio. I have I made a, a large uh, decorative pitcher, and I had one as a I think a hexagonal, right? So it's really great for like long or de really decorative handles, ones that you're not necessarily intending to be really picking something up by. Okay, so that's a great way to do it. There is a tried and true method, which I hate, but I'll show anyway, <laughs> called pulling a handle. And you do this, I'm right-handed obviously, so I'm going to hold it with my left hand. You have to assume that this much of the clay I'm not going to end up using. Now. I have never gotten through this demo without people giggling. 
So if you decide that this is hilarious and just and want to giggle, that's okay. The thing you need is a bucket of water or do it by the sink. You want to keep your hand wet. And then you want to start gently pulling. If you need a metaphor, it's like milking a cow, from what I've been told. There you go. Okay. I mean, it's like, have you milked a cow? No, of course I haven't milked a cow. From Long Island. What the hell am I going to milk a cow? Or go or anything. You know what I milk? The carton. I just pour the carton of milk. That's it. Right? What you're doing is slowly elongating. You obviously don't want to rush, because that's not going to be good. You want to have soft pressure, and as you get further down, don't squeeze hard, squeeze less. This is labor intensive and time consuming. Already my left shoulder is like, why are you doing this to me? And you'll find people that they'll just do this, and they'll like have them like go this long, and I don't know how to do that. That kind of drives me nuts. The key is you don't want to do like that. That's not good, right? So you want to be soft with it as it elongates. The most hilarious times were, of course, when this was being taught in college. You can shape it to your liking, i.e. I'm starting to put like a ridge into it. <coughs> I have to say this white clay works very well for this process. Some other clays don't work as great. And when you have it as long as you want to have it, is also the problem. I, now I gotta clean my hand one hand. <coughs> this is why I carry. Right. And when you have it the way you the length that you want it to. You can cut it. And then the key to this is that you let it hang off a ledge. Like so. This will give it the curve. But it's a slightly dangerous thing. You want to make sure you have enough here at the base so that way you can actually not fall over. Lord knows I've seen that, like, <laughs> like oh, right? Now the reason you have so much clay is that I could start doing another one. It's sort of like a, an assembly process, right? Which is fine, but like I said, it kills my shoulder to do it. Because, I don't know about you, but I'm almost 40 and I'm getting old. And 20 years of pottery is starting to wear and tear on my body a bit. My knees are definitely not what they used to be, and my shoulders aren't what they used to be either. So that's one way to go. And some people love that hand-pulled look. They think it's authentic. I believe this is what Nicole would classify as not cheating. Yeah. Yeah, hand-pulling it. Um, because like, you struggle, and it's arduous, and half the time you hate it, and, you know, it's... I, I was raised Catholic, so as a Catholic, this is like perfectly up, like you must suffer to do this. Now, the way that I will make a handle, and this kind of changed my life, like I avoided making mugs for a very long time, because that's the only way I knew to make a handle, and I didn't like it. So in typical style, if I don't like it, I avoid it. <coughs> For a simple five dollars, you can go on Amazon, Blick, Ceramic Shop, Bailey's, Sheffield Pottery. You can buy what's called a handle maker, like a stereo. Uh, this is made by Kemper Tools. They come in two sizes. This is the larger size. There's a slice, slightly smaller size. If you like this process and really want to make fancy handles, you can eventually invest in a diamond core extruder. Okay, that's about sixty to seventy dollars. I can't say they're definitely worth it, but they do make really cool looking handles. 
The best way to do it is with a large block of clay and you can knock them out, but I tend to go for a thick one when I'm doing this demo. You start, I would start closer to an edge and you pull through. Okay. And I pull this away. And pull it up. Now that's not the end of it. What I'm going to want to do is clean it a little bit. So I take my scouring pad. Take my sponge. Flip it over. I take my pin tool, I cut it with, in what they would technically call the bevel, but it's really just an angle. I'm going to hold on to that a little bit. And then I want to fold it back, like so. All right, there I have it. Now when you're attaching a handle, you want to try to make your handles first and then trim your pieces. That'll give the handle some time to firm up, so that way it can go on comfortably. Okay? So basically I would have made this handle, I would have then taken this piece and trimmed it. It's also important that the piece and the handle are about the same level of dryness. If this is dry and that is wet, it is not going to stick very well. So you want to give it some time to work on. Okay. When you're doing your handle, I recommend working on a dry sponge or a piece of foam or something. What you don't want to try and do is do this on a hard surface because as you do, you're going to be moving this around, you're going to end up messing up the piece you made. Okay? Whereas using a dry sponge, you have a lot of cushion because okay? so you're not going to really ruin it in any way. You want to first determine where you're going to attach the handle at the top and then pretty much at the bottom. I always have sort of a design in the middle. So I will kind of go above and below. I like to use several tools for this. Obviously I need my pin tool. To do my scoring, I like to use what's called a rake, because you know it looks like a tiny rake. This is a great little scoring tool, it's very helpful. And basically, some sort of modeling tool is usually pretty good. I tend to like something with a rounded point, because I find it's easy to get in to really smooth things out. And in this case, I'll use almost like a clay sculpting model too. It's got a nice thin edge. I can really get in there and craft it better on both sides. Okay. So, some people would tell you to use slip, that's completely up to you, if you want to use slip. I find just water is helpful, that also reminds me of one other tool I'm going to use. You may not think of it as a tool, but it certainly is one. Brush. Brush is very important. So I've scored. Yeah, I'll go with this one. I'm going to score this side too. Take 
Get your brush, a little bit of water. I'm going to make my connection here. Okay. I immediately start blending with my fingers just to keep it in one spot. And then I'm going to take my pen tool and cut it down accordingly. I'm use my scouring tool, my scoring tool. And also start blending with my fingers. This by no means is the end. I like to start here. The key to a good handle is blending the joints repeatedly. See why I like this? Like I can come in and I can really clean up without affecting the curve. If anything, I'm enhancing the curve. Now that I've done that, that piece of clay that I used before, that I cut off. I'm going to roll into a nice and foil. And I go around where the top of the joint is. Some people don't do this. I do. I find it makes my joints more stable. This is where I would use this tool. I first start just by pushing it in. And then from here I start blending outward. And blend into the joint. If you see a line or a crack, it's going to develop into a bigger crack. So that's why you want everything to be seamless. This is not a fast process, and I appreciate everyone's patience. I typically like to make the, the demos go quickly so I'm not boring anybody. You constantly want to clean this off. You don't want to get this to be too funky, or else you're really not going to get the clean lines you want to get. And now that I've done this, I go back to blending with my brush. I came up, up with for myself because how long it can take to put on a handle, roughly about 10 minutes for me. I never make more than six mugs at a time.
I found if I did Beyond 6, the quality starts going down in terms of the handles. So I'd make 6, and I knew that if I did 6, the 6th handle and the piece would still be at the right consistency. Whereas if I made, say, 10 or a dozen, by the time I got to that 10th, 11th, and 12th one, this would start getting too dry. And I'd start losing the handles and keep cracking and breaking off. So I just kept it to six, and I had, maybe I'd lose one. I'd rather take five out of six than eight out of 12. So that's just a personal rule. It's not like you guys have to follow that one to the letter, but I found it very helpful. After I've gone over it with my brush, I go over it with my scouring pad. After the scouring pad, finally comes the sponge. Now when it comes to storing your handle, your mug, you want to put it on a board. upside down. Keep it this way, gravity is pulling against the joint. You put it this way, gravity is pulling into the joint. Okay. You're also going to want to cover it, I wouldn't say tight, you see I drape it, gently pull this over, right? Not really suffocating it. I want air to get to it, but I want to get to it slowly. There's a very good chance it can always crack off, right? So I want it to slowly dry. If it dries too fast, this is definitely going to crack off and break, all right? So I want to keep it, and you want to almost give it a week to two weeks of slower drying time. Okay, especially as a communal studio. You have to assume you're not going to be getting here every day. If you were like doing this as a production potter and you're like literally working next to your pieces every day, you don't need as much time because you can check it. But because you're here maybe once, twice a week, give it a two week gentle, right? So as I've said before, typically on the um, shelves, the lower you go, the slower the drying. So if you're going to be doing handles for mugs, Try to get some prime real estate on the low end. Don't put it up high where it can get hit by the air condition. It'll make it dry too fast. Any questions about making handles? Okay. It's a long, laborious process, but it's worth it in the end. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time and your patience. <laughs> Thank you.